Hello. How are you? Good, thank you. How are you? Oh my gosh, I tried to like take a shower and get dressed in time for this call and I just ran out of time. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Well, why don't we talk about your beautiful new book, um, which is just amazing with your characteristic, beautiful illustrations and all the rest, these positive world messages and, and everything. Um, tell me a little about what made you write this book and why now? Well, I happen to have it right here. Amazing. I know. I prepared. Um, uh, it's called If You Come to Earth and... I have been incredibly fortunate to work with UNICEF and Save the Children and uh, had traveled with them to various countries over the years to Bhutan and Rwanda and Congo and India. And um, meeting children in, in all of these countries was something I think about every day. You know, it was, it was just an incredible privilege. And, but on some level, it was frustrating because I couldn't talk to them for the most part. Um, often they would have very little English and, and I run to some French and that's about it. Um, shamefully, I, I, I couldn't communicate with them. And that was, I would leave these tiny village schools on the top of a mountain where there had been maybe five or 10 kids and we'd spent the day together and we'd giggle and draw pictures because that is the way that I communicate with anyone if I can't talk to them. And, uh, but I would leave thinking, I don't, I want, there's so many things I want to ask you. I want to ask you about your lives. I want to ask you what you dream about, what you, you know, what makes you laugh. And so I, I could do as much as I could do with drawing, but I, I vowed to make a book that would be for all kids in the world about all of us and the planet we share and uh, the things that are familiar to us so that kids might see something they recognize in a book and also the things that, that we don't know about each other and the things that are surprising and, and unfamiliar. So that was the, that was the goal. Um, I had no idea it would take so long because essentially it is a book about everything in the world. And <laughs> <laughs> it, every time you put something in, you're leaving something out. And so it was helpful to find a narrator so I could blame the child. Well, that's this child's view of the world. Um, and, and everybody has their own view. So, so the omissions, are, omissions are theirs and, and um, not mine. Uh, but um, but it did take seven years and it, and it did take a village as, as most books do, but especially this one. Um, which part of the village was most helpful to you? <laughs> it was, uh, somebody asked me recently, what was the best part about making this book? And, and, and I said, without hesitation, it was the village because, you know, people are extraordinarily helpful when you, ask them questions and I'd always been a little bit shy and I would I would um, kind of avoid you know talking to a stranger but with this book I talked to so many strangers uh, because I, I wanted to know the people I was putting in the book um, everybody almost everybody in the book is somebody I either met or saw with my own eyes or chatted to on the subway or in Central Park or you know on a on a ferry in Bhutan a little tiny putt putt boat or just along the way so all of these people have cameos in this book and to me it was kind of putting real people in there so even if they look like a cliched representation of somebody that that person was real I saw them I spoke to them um, and and those people's stories are uh, intertwined on every page of this book and and to me when I open it it's this rich tapestry of humanity and and that with every interaction, I felt more grateful that I'm alive and part of that. And, and for all our differences and, and especially now, almost everybody has a smile and a story to tell you if you, if you open. And um, that was a big blessing for me. That's true. So now that you have sort of united everybody, <laughs> um, like, I feel that the world is so fractured right now. I feel like this is the most divisive time. I mean, I've certainly lived through, not that I'm so ancient, but you know, yeah. in, our, in, a, in recent history, I feel like it mm -hmm. just keeps getting worse. And you've been like this little soldier going around the world collecting, um, little, <laughs> you know, more like a, a mail lady or something, right? You're getting missives from everybody and, and mixing it all up. So yeah. with that unique point of view, like what can we do? Like, 
how can we how can we highlight the fact that we're all just human we're all going through the same stuff love and loss and what yeah. we put in our mouths for breakfast and you know just all the same stuff how how do we how do we make that message like rise to the fore i think for me i think there are two ways that um that that became sort of clear to me with this book, for me at least. Um, and then it's a sort of macro and, and micro kind of thing. But the one is to, to, to talk to people. And I think um, when, you, when you actually hear somebody else's story, and again, the, the kind of cliches of walking in someone else's shoes, which you can't ever really do, but, but to hear somebody else's story makes them real to you. And you know, I always think that that with curiosity comes a certain empathy. If if you're curious enough to ask another person instead of to make assumptions, how are you feeling? What do you feel about that? I don't know. I, I can imagine what your response might be, but I don't know. And so I should ask you. And if you're willing to tell me, then that is a gift. And then I will learn something. And that goes for people on who have very different political views to me, um, have they have signs in their backyard that I vehemently disagree with, and yet they will come and help me fix a flat tire. Um, you know, there's in Congo, I met some of the most wonderful, generous, warm people who felt that being gay was a terrible sin, and two of our four kids are gay. So there, there are so many things like that that I think, ah, oh, we just see things so differently, and yet there's this warmth and generosity to you, and I think if maybe if you met my kids, you might think differently. And maybe if I, you know, listen to your stories, I might be able to see more clearly what it's like to be a farmer and, you know, how difficult that has been. And so, so I think that's, that. so that's the micro. And then I think the macro is, um, is whenever there's something global and a pandemic is one of those things, but also a comet or an eclipse when we, instead of looking down at our feet or, you know, inside our own heads, we actually look out and up and realize that we are this one tiny planet in a vast, vast universe. And um, I think about, I think about the, the pale blue dot and uh, Carl Sagan, I'm a big Carl Sagan fan. Uh, and him saying in that that picture that was taken from Voyager 1, four billion miles from Earth, this this speck, that's us, that's here, that's everyone we know, everyone we love, everyone we've never met, suspended on a mote of dust in a sunbeam. That's That's all we are. And so if we can't learn to live together on this planet, you know, there's no hope for us. So to try with the daily conversations, I think. Wow. You're like, you should be like, like a Mother Teresa type <laughs> world icon. I feel like. <laughs> no, I mean it. We need voices like yours um, to drown out the other voices. Honestly, like this is such, this like so, just so speaks to my beliefs in my heart and, and what I think is important too. And it's, you say it in such a beautiful way and um, oh. it literally illustrated. So yeah. Um, <laughs> It's, it's, it's amazing. Have you always been this sort of holistic is the wrong word, but, you know, sort of globally minded and, um, you know, a uniting type of force? Like, has this been in your DNA forever? Is it something that's grown out of you in adulthood? I don't know. I mean, I've always been really conflict averse. You know, I was one of those kids. Oh, no, you know, let's not fight. Have it your way. <laughs> you know, it's just, um, but uh, I think, uh, I really think, having had the, the opportunity to work with, with UNICEF and Save the Children, you know, opened the world to me uh, in a way that I'll be forever grateful for. I mean, to, to, to walk into a village in the jungle in Congo where children had never seen anyone they didn't know before um, it was extraordinary. And, and to have, spend this day with them and, and then to walk away and think, I will remember this for the rest of my lives, but in my life, I don't know what, I don't know what you will think, but I think about those kids um, all the time and wonder what they're up to. And I hope they're well and surviving. And um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and when did, when did you, had you always been an illustrator? Like, did you love to draw from a young age? Tell me about the progression of that part of your life. I, 
did. I, I was very fortunate that my, my mother was a single mother, uh, but she really worked hard to make sure we always had art supplies. And even uh, in my case, I would go, I lived in a country town in Australia and after school, uh, I was allowed to walk home because that was the 70s and that's what you did. Um, and I would walk home past the butcher's shop and stop in and, and ask them for some of the paper, that the big sheets of paper that they'd roll sausages up in and, and they knew me and they were very kind. They'd roll up paper and give me a couple of slices of bologna into the bargain. So it was a fantastic deal for me. <laughs> um, but I, I always, always drew and my brother and I lived in most of our lives up trees with books and we had a, a rope strung between the trees and a basket and we would send books back and forth to each other. And he was older, so really I just wanted to read anything he was reading, you know, the Hardy Boys and, and <laughs> all those kinds of adventure stories and um, and Winnie the Pooh. And, and yeah, so we just we just were very lucky to grow up with books, um, which so many kids don't, you know, it's a, it's, it's this privilege that I completely took for granted as a kid. My, my father is a publisher in Australia. And, and so, you know, not only did we have books in every room of the house, but, but he was making books as well. So I got to see that, um, which was thrilling, you know, to turn a story and then put it, you know, into paper and ink and bind it into this beautiful physical object. Um, so I've always loved, I can't imagine not having books around me. We, we just downsized um, as empty nesters from a four bedroom apartment in Brooklyn into a cozy one bedroom, which we um, thought was just this delightful corner building filled with light, but it is the noisiest corner. <laughs> So you can probably hear, soon you'll hear a fire engine and a garbage truck. And then... I'm in Manhattan and usually <laughs> there are sirens back and forth here too. So I get it. No worries. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And so then how did you get your start illustrating professionally? Uh, I, it, it was what I always wanted to do. Uh, I was one of those kids who were, yep, that's what I'm going to do. Um, I, I think it was Winnie the Pooh that I would look at Ernest Shepard's drawings and, and trace them onto this butcher paper and try and figure out how, you know, break it down. Like, how did he make those lines and how did he put so much character into those tiny sketches? Um, and, and then I just sort of set about doggedly getting to do that. And I remember being sent my first manuscript um, and just getting goosebumps and thinking this is this is it was a book called Ruby's Wish written by Sherinian Bridges and it's a true story of her grandmother who grew up in China and she was one of the first girls to go to university and so it was it, it fed into all of my kind of feminist um, you know girls can do anything principles and it was this wonderful story and I had just spent time in China and so so everything kind of came together and it was uh, it was just thrilling um, and I still there there are most days I think it's uh, it's it's almost too lovely to to consider that this thing that I do is work you know it's the it's like I actually get to do this and call it work it's Traveling and, and drawing and books and children, all my favorite things, and, and, and they're all combined. So Aww. very lucky. My older daughter, I have four kids as well, and my older daughter um, was so excited that I was talking to you because she has read <laughs> all the ivy and beans. And oh. Like, we have, like, walls of ivy and bean. Oh, that's um, I'm just waiting for my next kids to get interested. So, and of course, <laughs> all, like, just so many of your beautiful picture books and – all the oh. rest. Um, <laughs> That's lovely. Really uh, rewarding to be able to hear from you. Um, are and are you remarried now? Not to keep prying into now. That I feel like um, we were actually going to get married this this summer, but uh, we decided we couldn't have a wedding if we couldn't hug our friends and family. So we're going to try and do it again next year. Um, we are building a a retreat for children's book writers and illustrators yes i wanted to talk to you about that what's it called again the millwood i wrote it down Mil uh, milkwood, called, milkwood farm it's called milkwood yes from from dylan thomas's under milkwood um so this is this great big project that we're doing and, and we thought we would get married there at the same time and uh but with with COVID, everything has slowed down a little bit but uh but it will happen and in the meantime we're we're building this thing that I'm thinking of more and more as a kind of arc for, for people to come and to be together and to eat and drink and walk and talk and, and draw and write and think and um, in lovely wildflower meadows in the, in the Catskills. And it's, um, I think it's going to be some sort of 
I hope some kind of sanctuary where we can, you know, where we can stop and be quiet and, and be noisy and be all the things in the same place that we haven't been able to do, you know, to gather together. I think it's something that people are yearning for. I know I am. How do I sign up? Where's the <laughs> I'm like, save me a bed or whatever. How, does it, how is it going to work? Seriously. Um, it will be, we'll probably sleep uh, 10 to 12 people. So there'll be quite intimate um, things and there'll be diff- a, a, a lot of different ways that it will work. There'll be long weekends for peers to get together because that's something that we don't get to do much in the industry. We, we meet for conferences and, and we gather in, you know, grim hotel bars and begin conversations that we can never finish and, uh, I share a studio in Brooklyn with uh, three other picture book makers, um, which is this everyday joy, you know, where this, where this family and this, we have this inbuilt community, we've been together for years, um, and, and we work together, we see each, we're invested in each other's books, and we, we throw our ideas around and um, are inspired by the way each other works and most people don't have that I've realized most writers and and illustrators um, work in relative isolation and uh, and so to be able to share this kind of thing you could come for a long weekend and get a a little taste of this um, and be fed really well and and with a wonderful bath all those things are very important for um, being creative I've found Uh, cocktails are (laughs) very good Um, so and then there will be longer uh, week-long workshops uh, for people who are thinking about getting into publishing or writing books for children or illustrating. And and then hopefully there will be sort of industry gatherings, so agents and editors and librarians and educators and and then things for community uh, groups for school visits and all those sorts of things. So it's a hugely, you know, far-ranging, ambitious, organic project. But We'll, we'll start slowly and see what happens. I love that. I actually, um, I have a two book deal with Penguin Random House for children's oh. myself. And I wrote oh, one of them, um, which Lord knows when it's coming out. And then I still have to write the second one. But I don't know, that doesn't make me appear, but maybe I can sneak in on one of your long weekends. Um, Absolutely. If you need any help with that project um, or support or Anyway, Thank let you. Me know, that sounds Thank so you. Amazing. Careful what you. Uh, careful I'm serious. What you I wouldn't say that <laughs> if I didn't mean it. Um, you know, you're basically doing like Yado for children's books, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. the that's the idea. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, do you have any advice for aspiring authors or aspiring children's book writers or illustrators or really anybody? Anybody, I could just sit and listen to your advice. <laughs> Whatever you have to say, just you know. <laughs> you're 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 way too kind. Um, I think uh, I was talking to some some uh, people who have been wanting to get published for a long time, and uh, and and I think there's often this this sense of there's this track, and you have to stay on it. And if you don't meet these goals by a certain time, then you're you're not you're failing at that um and and i just don't think it should be like that at all i think that um i think that that i was talking uh, anyway i am now i'm I, i'm a t- i cannot stay on a single linear train of That's thought okay. take I'm them all always you um can- <laughs> <laughs> i found i had a, 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 a brain scan recently for um these rotten migraines and and i got a picture of the inside of my brain and it was so thrilling to see to see all of these wiggly lines because that's exactly how my thoughts work and um there are i love maps and uh there's a there's a map called a meander map i don't know if you've ever seen these and it's the it's the map of the the course that a river takes over centuries and so you can look at like a meander map of the mississippi and it looks like the inside of a person's brain and just i love that idea of, of the way that thoughts move and intertwine and and I think that in our daily lives is how we get our ideas and how we should be inspired and how we should work. I think for me anyway, I work on 12 different things at once. And while I'm working, there are different compartments of my brain that are, that are um, dedicated to different things. The book that I'm close to finishing is right up the front and that's almost just busy work at this point. And then the one that's waiting in the wings is a little bit behind and that's where I'm doing heavy research and, and going down dead ends and rabbit holes. And, and then way at the back are all the books that are just 
bouncing around in this kind of great cacophony of, you know, of, of jumbled ideas and ricocheting. And, uh, and that's the most fun place back there because anything can happen. Um, and I, so I think I did, the advice would be just to encourage everybody to keep their ears and eyes open and to, to, to walk around thinking not this is this one track I'm on, but, but I could go this way, I could go this way. And there's something to be gained from all of those detours, even if it's not readily evident um, down the track, you will think, oh my goodness, that note that I wrote four years ago has just suddenly crystallized into an idea or the, the thing I bought at a flea market because I didn't quite know why, but I couldn't walk past it that I stuck in a drawer suddenly, you know, has opened some key to something that was locked. And so I'm, I'm all about, you know, the, the scrap books of the brain and, and, um, and any excuse really to go to flea markets. I think that's really, you know, what I'm, <laughs> what I'm advocating, which is something we're not doing right now, but hopefully will again. And what, uh, what are some of the 12 projects you might be working on right now? Like what's coming next? What can we expect? Um, well, I mean, this, this was such a, a gargantuan uh, thing, you know, seven, seven years and, um, and really kind of illustrating the world and uh, thinking about, it. I involved so many people in it. Like um, there was, there's a page in here, I'm gonna show you a page now. Yeah, please. Uh, there's a page in here of, um, of colors, how to, to, to paint all the colors in the world. Um, it's, it's this page. Um, and I asked the internet for color names, because I had all of these paint tubes and I thought, oh, it would be fun to give them names. I love going into paint stores and looking at the paint chip names. And my partner, Ed, and I play a game where we, um, we pocket a bunch of the paint swatches and then we fold the names back and we, we have to make the other person guess which names go with which colors. It's good on car trips when you're coming back from the, the hardware store. Um, but the internet gave me about, there were about 1,500 um, submissions and they were just so wonderful like one of them was don't get me started Jen for a color pink you know which is brilliant um, and vacuum bag dirt and you know oh, they're, they're so good so right now I'm writing to all the people two years later to thank them for their color names. Um, and this was another one the page that's about birds was I asked people their favorite birds around the world and and they all came in and I formed a giant bird with all of them so uh so 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 this is at front and center but one of the other books i'm working on is a book for grown-ups and it's called proust's bedroom um this painting you might be able to see behind me uh, i did after it's a little bit of a story the book proust's bedroom is going to be about my favorite writers houses uh which i am visiting around the world it's been suspended for for a minute but uh and the, it's part memoir and part biography of these writers and a little bit sort of travel um, going to all these places. And it's Herman Melville and Dylan Thomas and Virginia Woolf and Jane Austen and Beatrix Potter and, and um, a bunch of writers. But uh, when I was 18, I was, I was in Paris uh, thinking I had discovered it as all 18 year olds do. And I found myself um, at the Musée Carnavale in, um, that is sort of the history of Paris Museum. And I was, I'd been up all night and, you know, it was just so wonderful to, to wander Paris at dawn and then to arrive at this museum. And I found Proust's bedroom and I had never read a word of Proust, but I thought it was just impossibly romantic. And I took a snapshot, which when I got home to Australia, much later printed and put on my wall and I lived with this for, for, for all through college and when I moved to the States I brought this photograph with me it's always been on my studio wall and then one day I thought I'd make a painting of this bedroom because there was something monastic about this bedroom and I loved the the, the cell-like room and then this this decadent gold like dragon scales of a quilt I made the painting then a couple of years later, we were in Paris um, around New Year's Eve with my partner, Ed, and our four kids. And we found ourselves outside the museum. And I said, oh, kids, we can go, let's go and see Bruce's bedroom. And we went in there and, and my son ran ahead and, and we turned the corner. <laughs> and there it was, except it wasn't Bruce's bedroom. It was somebody else's bedroom. And my 18-year-old self had seen the label on the wall 
and taken the photograph, but the label actually referred to the next bedroom. Oh, no. Which I didn't like the look of at all. It was quite dour. There was a lot of ugly furniture in it. And I thought, oh, no, that can't possibly be Prue's bedroom. It must be this one. And so I've been living, you know, under this painting and dining out on it for, for years. And in fact, the someone at the French consulate said, oh, I hear you did a painting of Proust's bedroom. Can we use it for the anniversary of Swan's Way? And thankfully, I was out of the country because otherwise it would have been my everlasting <laughs> humility and shame that um, they would have had to gently say, um, <laughs> it's actually Paul Leoto's bedroom and not Proust's bedroom at all. So that is the introduction to this book. Of uh, I thought after that the least I could do would be to to read Swan's Way. Uh, so I'm I'm working my I've read Swan's Way now. My, I'm slowly working my way through um, Remembrance of Things Past, and and um, it's a uh, it's an interesting sleepy read with beautiful <laughs> bits. And I don't have you ever read Proust? I did. I read I, I read Swan's Way in college. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I think I have to read it about six times before it's, you know, maybe all in there. There are bits that made me laugh out loud, and then there were bits that I just read the same page five times and couldn't retain it at all. Yeah, I should probably go back. <laughs> well, that's a wonderful <laughs> story. But uh, I love the yellow bedspread. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, congratulations on your book release and getting it out this book about the world out into the world. It's really exciting and I'm sure makes you feel so accomplished and, um, you know, to have that sort of closure on such a giant project that's gone on for so long. So um, enjoy, you. enjoy the success that follows and, um, and let's stay in touch. Um, yes. You know, I'm not far away and um, <laughs> well, uh, I want to keep, uh, I already started following the Milkwood farm Instagram account. So I'm, I'm oh. very interested. I will be tracking the progress. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's been lovely, lovely to talk to you. You too. Have a great day. Thank you. All Bye. Right. Bye-bye.